Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome everybody at uh, this uh, new Backbase webinar here at the uh, end of November. Uh, today's topic is uh, digital first and how to build a digital first banking operation. My name is uh, Jaak Pleiter. I'm here together with um, Tim Rutten. Uh, maybe before we dive in, uh, Tim, maybe a few uh, logistics. Um, for those of you who wonder, the slides and the recordings uh, will be distributed afterwards as usual. And if you'd like to uh, share or promote this webinar uh, at Twitter, you can use the at Backbase uh, tag uh, to make that happen. Hello, Tim. Good afternoon, Jörg. How are you? I'm doing really well. How are you? Right. So um, today's topic is digital first. Um, what do we mean with that? Um, what you see here on the slide uh, for people in the audience, um, digital first um, has everything to do with uh, the title you see here on the screen. Uh, this is a quote from Mark Andreessen, former uh, founder of Netscape, now a VC in Silicon Valley. Software is eating the world. And what Mark is basically describing here is that tech savvy companies uh, in transportation, in hospitality, are utilizing a digital technology platform to create not only uh, to create a digital service uh, that is very popular with end consumers. So maybe we can dive into the kind of look at a few of these examples and how they are actually changing society and what it means eventually for banking. So here's the first example. Um, what you see here is a little app. I think we are all very familiar with this app, but this little app is basically a tech platform that connects drivers and we all know, et cetera. But this thing kind of in only a few years became a mega institution with a market cap of dozens and dozens of billions. Uh, and basically they are completely dis disrupting uh, transportation as we know, right? So I think we all know the example, but what is really critical here is that um, there was Google Maps, there's Amazon Cloud Computing, but these guys are basically taking a few digital technologies, creating a technology platform, and with that, they are completely reshaping uh, an industry. Um, what is also important here is to note that these guys are doing this in a regulated industry, just like banking, right? And there has been a lot of, um, it, it's kind of arbitrary, but there's, it's not without any anxiety. In a lot of town halls, uh, in a lot of uh, city councils, people really have to actively debate uh, how do we allow the traditional taxi world and transportation laws uh, allow and collaborate uh, with kind of an Uber model? How do these things kind of coexist? And what is really interesting, I think that uh, what we basically see that in a regulated industry, because of the fact that the platform and the app were so powerful, and they're basically were actually generating the love of the end user, they actually created a 10 times better experience, they basically forced the lawmakers to allow them to exist or to coexist. So it's an interesting example. Here's another one, uh, Airbnb. I think most of us uh, are familiar with them. They actually kind of, uh, if you have a spare uh, apartment or a spare bedroom, you can rent it out uh, on the Airbnb within their community. It grows very quickly. Now it has millions and millions and millions of listings. Also not without uh, controversy because in many city town halls, again, regulated with the hotel industry, the existing incumbents, these guys are introducing yet another new platform and they have um, the popular vote. Uh, so both, uh, they basically actually kind of create a whole, uh, a whole new, I would say economy and the sharing economy and that sharing economy. So both the app, but also the economic model where people actually can have an affordable place to stay, but also people can make an extra income via the platform in addition to what they do normally in life. It was a very powerful mo uh, movement, both from a convenience point of view and a good alternative uh, to the incumbents, but also from a, a business model, a revenue point of view for all the different stakeholders. So again, they have been forcing uh, the incumbents and also the lawmakers in, in many countries around the world to basically allow a new digital technical platform to coexist with uh, with the incumbents. So that um, and here, you know, this little thing, it's also a technology platform. I think most of us, of course, are super familiar with this, but it's only 20 years ago that this started as a little online bookstore and now it's the largest company in the planet and it's basically with its technology and its platform, it's basically dominating a whole lot of different industries. And also very interesting, they took their platform, their technology platform, their digital first platform, and they started to rent it out. Uh, and they started to rent it out as Amazon Web Services, which is now a very large um, part of their business. It's a, it's a, I think they are generating six to seven billion US dollar in revenue on a quarterly basis by just renting out, initially the idea of let's rent out spare platform capacity, it became a business 
uh, in itself. So what this thing basically does uh, is, and that's kind of the key thing, and that's kind of related to the digital uh, first uh, topic, uh, software is eating the world, and this is very much correlates with the rise of these digital platforms. So, say maybe you can elaborate a little bit uh, what's here on the screen. What, what are those platforms, and how are they different from, uh, let's say, the traditional business model? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, I think you already see it a little bit on the slide here. That you see that on the left, if you look at traditional businesses, um, you could describe those as being relatively asset heavy. Um, asset heavy, for instance, comparing Airbnb to uh, let's say the Hilton hotel chain, uh, you find the Hilton, of course, they own the full, uh, let's say, business and everything that is uh, needed in terms of assets to run a business. Think hotels, think the employees actually run the hotel and everything related to, uh, to running that business. Very traditional, um, owning the full, let's say, end-to-end, -end, uh, yeah, assets that you need to run, uh, to run that business. And therefore difficult to scale, I guess. Very difficult to scale given that you really need all those assets and the real estate and the employees yeah. and so forth. Yeah. Um, if you look at the right side of the slide, that's basically uh, the Airbnb example, if you will, uh, platform businesses, where indeed those are typically highly scalable. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, that sounds like, sure, we want to be highly scalable. What does it actually mean? Um, it effectively means that these digital first players are using technology to build a platform that is digital first. And by digital first, it actually means that adding a new customer on top of an existing platform is you know, basically possible. Uh, you can possibly do that at zero marginal cost. So Meaning the additional, the additional uh, cost to add a customer is are relatively, uh, they are very low. Correct. Correct. The additional incremental additional costs are. Yeah, so, to zero. yeah, if you compare that to, for instance, for Hilton opening opening a new hotel room, that's around $200,000 in terms of uh, investments, either real estate and the employees yeah. to uh, actually make that happen, mm -hmm. where with Airbnb, it's yeah, a few cents at best, and they have yeah. millions of listings, obviously, on the platform, where uh, Hilton is, of course, limited uh, by the physical <laughs> growth that they can, uh, can have. So I guess also with these digital platforms, uh, or within the platform business model, these digital first business models, uh, I guess they can also really easily scale internationally. You make them yeah. multilingual. Um, we also now see that with the Revoluts and the N26 or the Monzo's of this world, a pan-European or now even global rollout. Of course, you need to have a few licenses, like a pan-European European banking license or something in the US. But with a platform, you go through, you, you basically can scale beyond country boundaries uh, quite quickly. Correct. Correct. And using technology, you can do it uh, extremely fast and at a low cost base. Very nice. Very nice. All right, so basically what we're discussing here today in the, in the next couple of minutes is, is about digital disruption. And disruption is quite serious, but it is already happening, as most of you know. So we basically uh, today are already in the, in the third wave of digital disruption. If we look at the first wave uh, from 1995 to 2005, it was pretty much with music and, and photography and video rentals. Right? Who's renting a DVD? Uh, you can hardly imagine that today with the, with the Netflix of this world. Then from 2005 to 2015, major impact, for instance, in the travel industry or in the retail industry and also in the broadcasting and, and printing industry. So that's the second wave. And now for the third wave, another group of industries, including banking and insurance, in this third wave, uh, those industries will see significant impact. I think the good news is that what I, what I really like about this picture, A, that um, it's not the first time. So I can imagine in 1995, um, you don't have the point of reference, right? Yeah. You, 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 don't, there, you don't know what the real impact is. I think for us to live today in 2018, we already have seen it happening. We've seen it in broadcasting, we've seen it in video rental, we've seen it in e-commerce. So it is very clear how dangerous and how impactful uh, disruption can be. Yeah. But it also shows a cookbook that um, incumbents that are proactive to basically fully embrace a digital transformation, they actually can kind of build a sustainable business model. Correct. Right? Correct. So it's not brand new. Yeah, perhaps one thing to add here is uh, if you look at the 95 bracket, uh, there was music, photography, and so forth. Uh, of course, in the 90s, you had a, a player called Napster and mm. Kazaa. There were a lot of these players that were disrupting the market and they let's say, got to do a lot of legal uh, pressure from bigger players. Yeah, it was going to be the piracy type of model. Exactly. We were all scared, or at least the industry that was yeah. affected was scared. Um, it took around one and a half, perhaps two decades, for Spotify to really mature and take a sizable uh, piece of the market uh, in reality. I guess the initial Apple with the iStore, where they basically also said, we're going to do this in a regulated way, we're going to do this where people actually pay for, for yeah. a song, right? So, and then eventually Spotify. So there's also some leeway. So there's, there's leeway, there's some... 
Same thing with Netflix. Only in 2007, they started moving into digital, and only now they're actually hitting a, a real business model that is... Uh, so then within 10 years, within 10 years, Netflix, 2007 to 2008, uh, a, decade. a decade, a full decade again, but then global domination. Correct. And that's basically what we're seeing here on the slide as well. Banking is up next. Right. right. Okay. We have a decade. Let's dive in. <laughs> All right. So disruption is quite serious. The impact uh, can be quite devastating. Um, what you see here on the picture is uh, a diagram. Uh, here you see the market share uh, on the um, vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, you see time. And you basically see that in a decade, let's say a decade or maybe 15 years, a span of 15 years, uh, the incumbent business models, like for instance the blockbuster DVD rental model, over time is replaced by a streaming video model like uh, a Netflix, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, worst case, what you see that the incumbent business models over time will completely disappear, right? Like the DVD rental store, yep. gone, don't exist. Or the incumbent business models are significantly reduced. We're talking here about a 50 to 70% reduction in market share. And you eventually see that these new digital business models, typically powered by a digital platform, highly scalable, uh, take the majority of the market share and basically become the new norm. What is also maybe interesting here is to see that uh, who are the players that actually are going to kind of own these new business models? Is it just the challengers? But it can also be actually the incumbents that are changing their business model in time and actually actually really transform their business model and they do a quite a complex maneuver, but how do you switch from your incumbent business model into this new digital business model, and how do you execute this in a, in a very decisive manner, right? So that's kind of the, the typically how digital disruption is working, and again, fortunately enough, we are in the third wave, so we have seen this happening before, and we can kind of predict uh, the certain outcomes, and we can also showcase and highlight companies that actually, incumbents that actually successfully made the transition. So the recipe, the cookbooks are much more clear than I would say 10 years ago. So where are we with banking? I think with banking, it's very hard to say. It probably depends a little bit on the territory, on the region, on the country, right? Yeah, most certainly. Um, it's, it's hard to gauge, but definitely based on regions, there's, uh, for instance, in the APEC region, mm -hmm. I think there's way more pressure coming out of the uh, Alibaba's and the Tencent's yeah. uh, compared to what we're seeing in, for instance, uh, the North American region. Yeah. Right. So different, the different maturity model maturity model there. So I guess um, instead of debating where we are exactly on the time scale, I think one thing is for sure that disruption is going to happen and it is going to happen at scale and I think every bank has a fundamental choice uh, to uh, decide to take action and is that, is that via an innovation lab, is that via a mobile app, but how decisive are you in actually uh, transforming your business model and are you transforming your business model? I guess that's uh, the key question. So that's kind of also highlighted here in this next uh, slide. And, and what I really like about this slide is that it, uh, it asks the question how to become digital first. Because uh, what we see with most banks um, is that today, in, in a lot of banks, if we are fair, digital is still something on the side. It's a very cool app, a mobile app with a nice rating in the app store. It's a nice fancy incubation lab. But it's if we're honest, it's, it, it's good and it's nice progress, and yes, it is digital, but they are not at the core of the bank. The core is still the classic old bank, and then there's some digital initiatives, I would say, on the side. If we are fundamentally, and that's really what we would like to explore in this webinar today, what do we need to do to become digital first? And maybe even in the first place, do you need to be digital first? And that's a different, a different answer for everybody here in the audience. But our, our assumption here is our vision for Backbase. It's our mission is that we believe that digital disruption is happening. It's happening for banking. Um, there are fintech challengers. There are big tech challengers. There's all these things. But the business model fundamentally will change. And the hypothesis of this webinar is basically banks need to be on a mission to by, by 2025 uh, to be digital first. And that's digital in the core. Yeah. So we're going to explore, imagine you would like to be there and you kind of share that vision. How do we get there? What can we do? Here you see a nice example, and maybe Tim, uh, you can elaborate a little bit on. This is uh, the uh, Development Bank of Singapore, yep. and they won quite a few awards uh, within their digital transformation. So this is an example of an existing incumbent bank that basically said, okay, we need to do digital transformation. And yep. not just with a PowerPoint or a McKinsey exercise, but we really want to change the bank. 
All right. So this is uh, DBS, that's Development Bank Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, and in 2018, uh, these guys they won uh, the prize for best digital bank globally. Um, it's quite a price. With, it's, it's a price with serious recognition. Um, and also on top of this, there's a pretty solid case study on what they've actually done. Um, and the whole DBS journey has been taking the bull by the horns, as you can see here on the slide, meaning they went all in. And let's uh, let's look at what the journey looked like. So first of all, if you look at this quote here, this is from Piyush Gupta, the CEO of DBS. And he basically says, well, the best way to fight disruption is to preempt it and disrupt ourselves. Uh, most likely statement that uh, you might yourself also make within your uh, within your institution. Okay, but, but this guy actually pulled it off. Yeah, but I'll be a little bit uh, skeptical here. There are so many of these kind of, okay, we sure. do digital transformation, we won the award, la, 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 la. We from Banking Forum X gift uh, an award to another bank. I mean, I'm, honestly, I'm a little bit skeptical. Yeah. So what is what is different with the uh, with the approach here? Why why is this real? Yeah, let's look at the next slide. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things that uh, that these guys actually did in the past four or five years, they literally asked themselves in the boardroom the question, what would Mr. Basils do? Yeah. How would Amazon go into the banking domain, and how would they play? That's a pretty powerful question, actually, because. I, I don't know about people in the audience, but if I think about Amazon or, or Vsauce, it's like, it's not digital on the side. It's it's all in. It, yep. It's even close to aggressive. Yep. And it's very aggressive. And it's also technology savvy with a very savvy business model. So the combination of a very savvy business is also a more uh, interesting for the long run. Not optimizing short-term uh, returns, but really kind of building the platform, getting the infrastructure in place, building the critical mass, eventually to dominate, right? Correct. The, the funny thing here is if you look at the slide, the DBS logo is on the right bottom. This is a real slide from themselves that they also presented at their investor days, yeah. uh, which is called their digital transformation investor days, meaning for them it's the only and biggest theme that they're pushing for. Yeah. Uh, and this question has helped them to really yeah, make up their minds on how to achieve this. Um, and going forward, the actual outcome of their strategy is that they understood that they, they needed to become digital to the core. Right, like deep, deep, deep to the core. So it's not a little thing on the side, like a little lab or an incubator. Yeah. But they really understood that they had to move from a certain reality, legacy, waterfall, manual, Demo. and so forth, to a reality where everything was technology savvy, the microservices, cloud, APIs, and so forth, where they could really start to yeah, digitally dominate in their space and have that speed uh, to market that we typically talk about. So I also heard uh, the IMG CIO stating something like this in the first day. We, we, we are becoming a tech company. We are becoming a tech savvy company with a banking license. But it fundamentally means that uh, where classic bankers don't know technology or Tesla, this, if, you, if you say this digital to the core, it basically means you have to embrace a much larger part of technology as part of your DNA, your skill sets, the people, your culture, your operating process. So it's almost like how do you inject Google, Apple, Microsoft, Netflix type of DNA into the bank. I think a lot of the banks do have a lot of technology, right? But I guess it's not digital. Correct. So that's more the classic technology world. So how do you also, there's enough of technology in the bank and there's enough of IT investment there, but it's more the, can we say it's a traditional, more of the- Yeah, it's basically what you see on the left part of the slide. There's legacy systems before, there's waterfall thinking. Those systems are there for a reason. They've been delivered there over the past few decades mm -hmm. until here. Uh, but to actually make a proper impact and truly service your customers digital, you need to make them. Let's analyze it. So what we see here on the, on the screen is that they pulled it off apparently, right? They yeah. to the outside world and they do the investor days and it's all about digital transformation. But what can they show for now, four years later? Yeah. So what is uh, extremely interesting to find in their, uh, in their reports, which are publicly available, by the way, um, they were the first ones to properly attribute digital transformation to the bottom line, like literally to uh, the financial numbers and the financial statements of the bank. Yeah. Um, and what you see here on the screen is um, yeah, basically a comparison between a traditional customer on the left and a mm -hmm. digital customer on the right. Um, and what you can see there is that the uh, income per customer in digital is significantly higher, almost twice the amount. It looks like twice, right? Yeah. yeah. There's a little bit of a higher cost to serve in absolute terms, but in relative terms, it's it's pretty much nothing. So relative compared to higher income? Relative compared to the traditional customer. Yeah, right? Yeah, 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 fair enough. And at the end of the day, this obviously results in higher profit per customer. And these are just, uh, let's say, macro high level, uh, let's say, numbers that came out of the, uh, the financials that they shared. Uh, but already this claims 
there's a lot of potential here. Higher income and a lower cost in digital. Yeah. So basically, the thing you say that all these materials, all these slides, and also the data points you see here, they are from uh, investor presentations from DBS, and they are available online. Yep. If people would like to search them in Google, what would be the right keywords for them to uh, roughly? Uh, yep. Uh, Go for DBS investor report, and you'll find it. Yeah. Yep. Or DBS digital transformation, something like that. Yeah. You will definitely find well, it. This is literally the title of the report. It's all right. Yeah. Okay, it's there. Perfect. Yeah. You can just Google that. So just. Uh, Tomorrow, we're going to share all the slides with you. Uh, everybody will get a copy, including the recording of this webinar. And then uh, it's even more easier to, uh, to find the data in case you are interested. But it's very good data because there's also a lot of additional data points behind these pictures we see here at the diagram. There's, there's, a, lot lot of, there's a lot of good data. Yeah, perfect. All right. So um, the remaining uh, part of the webinar, we would like to kind of dig in a little bit. Okay, imagine, just like DBS, as an incumbent bank or even as a, as a challenger bank, what are the, the key pillars uh, we can explore uh, to become truly digital first by 2025? Right? We identified, uh, for convenience sake, three major categories or three pillars. One, let's kind of have a look into the future. What are the key elements of the customer experience we need to create? Because um, one of the key lessons we've seen here in digital transformation is that the party that kind of the, the, the institution that owns the customer experience it's a real battle out there. Who owns the customer experience? Unless you want to be a dumb pipe, right? So creating a compelling customer experience is really critical to survive in these kind of you know, platform-oriented business models. It's not just the technology, but it's also the technology almost kind of expressing itself in something that is super easy, super slick, without any friction. Then the second pillar is the, the business model. How do we kind of, uh, we currently in the incumbent business model, we have revenue streams, they are partly fee-based, they are balance-based or, or uh, income-based, but how do we kind of transform that into the future? What of those elements are sustainable? What are the elements that we need to change uh, or reinvent within a digital platform? And then finally, it's all about uh, execution. I think most of us uh, are now fully aware that digital is important and all of us have a digital transformation vision or roadmap. What is really difficult is how fast can we actually execute? So it's our philosophy. Um, we talk a lot with uh, banking executives around the world and, and consistently I hear them talking about the fact that we are uh, competing with speed. It's not even our competitors, of course, but we're in, in essence, how do we mobilize our own execution speed? How do we increase our own velocity? And how do we uh, inject more of that digital DNA in our culture and in our ways of work? So uh, I guess we, we're going to dive in and uh, we're going to explore all, uh, all three. Yep. Let's start with the customer experience. Yeah. So basically what you see here on the screen is uh, the, the key target groups. Who are these customers? And uh, we're not going to elaborate too much in, in too much detail, but Basically, what you see, we have four customer segments, the classics, the converted, and then all the way to the right uh, to the alpha kits. I think if you look at the classics and the converted, um, it's, it's safe to say, and we still hear a lot of uh, executives, they say, well, our, you know, our, our mobile app is fine. Our current distribution model with our current business model is totally fine. We're very profitable. You know, everything is good. But if we look into the future, if we look at Gen Y and Z, and even the alpha kits, the kids, our kids now at home playing Fortnite. I think universally all around the world, uh, people are actually uh, playing, uh, playing this. These are the customers for tomorrow. So what can we do actually to uh, make sure that our value proposition, if we look at digital transformation and if we're looking at 2025, we really have to skate uh, where the puck is going. And that's pretty much uh, the generation, the emerging uh, generation. So. Let's look into a couple of examples, um, Tim, uh, how that future might look like, okay? Yeah. So first of all, if we really want to go digital first, uh, one of the key elements that we need to nail is seamless onboarding. Um, if you think about the typical challenger bank, the typical neo bank, uh, think Revolut, N26, um, those types of players, starting a journey and becoming a net new customer to their banking uh, application is an extremely seamless journey. Yeah. And if you look at the, the let's say, four screenshots that you see here on the glass, we've demoed those multiple times before. That's what we believe needs to be in any type of digital first banking platform to onboard your customers. Prerequisite, but this is no branch, Correct. no paper, no human interaction, all done. Pretty, pretty much, much, pretty pretty much in five minutes, right? Yeah. Pretty much in five minutes. Correct. 
to measure. Yeah. All right, so that's uh, the first kind of key ingredient, seamless onboarding. Next up. Yeah, so the next one is, uh, it says in the title, super easy, super safe. Uh, in reality, this is all about uh, authentication and security. Um, how do you simply onboard, uh, re register yourself for an existing bank that you're already banking with, and you want to, let's say, download the mobile application and register yourself properly? How do you use biometric authentication to basically confirm an, uh, a transaction, for instance, yeah. that you're doing on web, and then confirm with your, uh, let's say, mobile device, which is acting as a token? Mm -hmm. um, how do you use these smarter patterns that you see in these, again, these more modern applications like the neobanks are currently playing with. How okay. do you bring it to life? This is critical, right? And I think there's also a bit of disruption going on, right? It, it's it's our money. So this has, it, it's not my Gmail account, which is already you know, important for to be secure, right? So this is my banking account. So security is critical. I guess we know right now that just user name and password is not safe enough, right? There's the phishing stuff, there's all of that stuff. So I guess we need to have stronger authentication. But the problem always has been that stronger authentication is more safer, but the user experience is horrible. So it's the classic trade-off between seamless journeys versus safe, right? I think that's the classic. I guess what is really uh, exciting is that now with um, the smartphone becoming your biometric device, with fingerprints, with face recognition, we basically can now replace hardware tokens that were extremely secure, but you need to bring your token. We can now actually really replace that with our smartphone. So we basically have the hardware token. And I guess the smartphone capabilities or the smartphone security capabilities, they will make this possible. Is that fair to say? Yeah. They're maturing to the level that we can now properly do this. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So that's another major thing. If you look at your uh, bucket list, uh, how do you leverage smartphone technology and built-in security technology within each of these smartphones, and especially with the more modern versions of Android and iOS? How do you utilize those technologies like strong customer authentication, multi-factor authentication, risk-based authentication, that we have seamless customer journeys, super smooth, without any third-party devices, also without uh, passwords that are not safe, so extremely secure, but also very smooth and only a step up authentication when there's an increased risk, right? right? Yeah. That's pretty much the, uh, the recipe for what we need, to, what we see that it is needed within the next couple of years. The next topic. Yeah, so think about your own daily life, how you use your retail banking application, for instance. Um, I would say that nine, nine out of 10 cases should be using a mobile device to yeah. do your daily banking. Mm -hmm. um, so to become properly digital first, you have to be mobile first in reality, yeah. right? Um, if you look at typical experiences, whether they're native or any other technology, it doesn't even matter that much. Um, but it should start mobile first to make sure that on the go, in 9 out of 10 cases, you can do everything you need to do on your mobile device. It sounds a little bit uh, maybe uh, too ambitious or maybe even aggressive, but basically it means that I don't need a physical branch. Right? I don't need paper. I don't need to go to my website or the online banking environment. I pretty much can do most of this stuff or if not everything. And generation, especially also if you look at this newer generation with Gen Y, Gen Z, or even Alpha Kids, it is very, very likely that these people expect everything in a smartphone. Totally. So also, if you look at the screenshots here, it's all about self-servicing. Yeah. Replacing cards, uh, setting my PIN code, blocking a card, uh, depositing a simple check in the U.S. context. Setting notifications, alerts, preferences. Exactly. Right. Simply from a mobile application. Yeah. And I think, again, also here, this is not, we're not talking about a decade. Let's say this is going to happen in 10 years. No, this, this is already this, here. This is now. This is, this is tomorrow. Now. I mean, yeah. uh, five years out, this is too late. Right? Way too late. You're already losing it. Yeah, yeah clear. All right. Uh, what do we see here? Yeah, so Connecting this, results. Yeah, this is all about the ecosystem. So, uh, of course, there's been a lot of talks, let's say, the past five years about open banking and what is it really going to bring to the actual business uh, in Europe that will be within the PSD2 context. We see multiple regions now moving into a reality where regulators are asking banks to open up. That's only one ingredient. Uh, we believe as backbase, if you want to properly become digital first, you're also going to look outside of the typical banking ecosystem. So sure, account aggregation is a great first step to bring personal finance management, for instance, to one single application where you own the customer relationship in your, uh, in your experiences. But on top of this, if you look at the right part of the slide here, why not integrate with other players in the ecosystem and make super compelling propositions in doing so? For instance, connecting Amazon to your banking experience, that whenever you reach a certain saving goal, for instance, we automatically buy a certain product that you've been saving for. Why not? 
we truly believe that the, the, the opportunities and the combinations are endless. Yeah, so, but there's also some really kind of, uh, there's also, so account aggregation is one. It's like my financial life in one place, perfect, nice. And, and nobody has actually cracked that yet properly. Right. So yeah. let's see if that's really going to happen. The, the second part is also like as a small business owner, I, I have my uh, small business banking account, I have my bookkeeping system, I have invoices. How can these two things kind of actually work together yep. or complement each other, right? So, or how can I actually delegate or authorize my bookkeeper to do certain things on, on my behalf? Mm -hmm. Or with e-commerce, uh, with for instance payment validation, how can I authorize an e-commerce provider to kind of withdraw money from my account uh, in a payment scheme, right? Mm -hmm. So it's more kind of the interconnected area. I think relatively close to managing your money, like account aggregation or paying in the context of e-commerce or executing a, a saving goal in the context of e-commerce or bookkeeping in the context of both small business banking, kind of making sure that um, it is not integrating for the sake of integration. I think it's more for reducing friction, right? Yeah. Or making the ecosystem seamlessly work together. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another major thing. Maybe not, uh, do, how do you see this? Is this something you would expect in the next two, three years or is it a little bit more uh, down the road? No, this is a bit more down the road. Uh, but this is definitely where a lot of the let's say more modern players are playing currently. Uh, so you see that because they're digital first, because they, have, because they have a platform in place, they can easily assemble these types of combinations. You know, as an example, if we go to another platform player like Uber, what I really like about Uber, they did apparently uh, a value partnership with Google in Google Maps. Yeah. So now in the context of the Google Maps, I basically can order an Uber. Right, that's a very nice partnership. It makes sense. In the in the map application, I'm looking for transportation. I ask for directions. I can click on the Uber button. I switch to the Uber app, and off we go. So it's also it's not only per se I think technology integration, but it's also business model or partnership integration where applications or capabilities that are complementary basically start to crosslink and and generate traffic uh, towards each other. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's a, that's a nice insight. Let's uh, let's go to the next one. Yeah, this is all about making it smart. So uh, if you've seen previous Backbase uh, webinars, uh, we call uh, we basically call this whole topic smart banking. Uh, we're effectively we're moving away from uh, very simple static, let's say, advice uh, or recommendations mm -hmm. uh, towards actually making banking smart, meaning insightful, yeah. and truly helping the end customer in their daily financial lives. Yeah. Um, so you see a few examples here on the screen where. You're basically monitoring uh, all the accounts of the customer. You're giving them relative insight, a very relevant in insight, and you're helping them grow uh, their financial positions. So I guess also uh, behind the scenes here is that if you have a digital platform, and let's say a digital banking platform, you have access to a lot of data. Transaction data, behavioral data, you basically know a lot. So I, I guess to execute this, you probably have to ask your end user for consent to utilize that data. Yep. And then based on the fact that you have access to the data, you can define business rules or monitoring rules or smart learning AI algorithms or machine learning kind of uh, concepts to analyze the data and then to kind of get insight or signal out of the data, right? So for instance, with monitoring, if you have access to the data, you can see that a certain transaction happened twice in the same time frame. That doesn't really seem uh, logical. So you can actually get the signal out of the data and monitor the safety or the well-being of your end customer. Or based on their spend behavior, you can give them insights about how much spare money they have, right? Yeah. So I guess over here, it's the fact that you have the data and then you can kind of utilize AI or machine learning or rule-based kind of targeting mechanisms to get signal out of the data. Yeah. So is this, this almost looks like a, um, a personal assistant, right? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. It's basically your personal banking assistant. Um, where also the other reality is that other modern day applications are doing similar things for you. Yeah. Like Google Photos is automatically generating albums, it's automatically doing facial recognition, it's automatically helping you in using your application better. Yeah. Uh, similar concepts are expected in digital banking. Totally. Certainly. I already see it with my kids. They are five years old and they already kind of see the, the, the photo recognition. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's logically. Cool. They play Fortnite and in the game they can play against, my son is calling it, I'm playing against AI. So he's playing auto mode, and actually the, it's a real competitor uh, models for them to practice. So the, our kids, and I'm convinced for all the kids around the world, they are already, they expect it. They're using it already today. Yeah. 
right? And also speaking for my own generation, I don't like, uh, let's say, repetitive, simple tasks to classify data or to, to get my own signal out of my financial right. statement. So even in your email, the auto suggest now in Gmail, right? Yeah. They already kind of make up a suggestion to finish your sentence. So those little, those little facilitators, yeah. they are truly useful. They truly help you to structure uh, work or get insight. Very so nice. it's a crucial element to, uh, to properly become digital first, and we see the first signs of this already with the more modern players. So also by 2025, having a banking application without this, pretty lame, yeah, right? Not, not going to work. Not relevant anymore. anymore. Yeah. There. Cool. All right. So let's uh, summarize this. This was the first pillar, uh, the customer experience pillar, and how important it is to own it. And I guess the, the key takeaway here is let's skate where the truck is going. And the, that basically means we have to focus on these digital first customers, Gen Y, Gen Z, and the Alpha kids that are really already kind of expecting those capabilities within their games, within their Spotify, within their Netflix, uh, for sure, they expect a whole different level of customer experiences that basically connects the dots and is uh, seamless mobile first. Let's go to the next one, the business model. Tim, I know you've been uh, doing some research about uh, this topic. Uh, you've been discussing this at Backbase Connect, our, our user conference. Yep. Can you give us a quick uh, rundown? What's what is, what is digital transformation in the context of banking and, and how does it impact the, uh, the business model? Yeah, yeah. so <clears throat> basically we're looking at a similar slide uh, as we just introduced. Mm -hmm. um, and the real question here is, how do we build these new digital business models? And yeah. what are the actual trade-offs we can make to either end up at the top, uh, to truly transform and, and fully make the leap, or are we willing to niche out and uh, basically optimize our business model for, uh, for that reality? Um, Right now, if you look at the uh, the current slide, you see a few examples here, um, and those examples are effectively showing you that there's a lot of platform players already pulling this off at scale. Think PayPal, think Argen, think Stripe, Alipay. It's, it's happening all across the globe. So what's happening here? I think it's quite important. This is already an area I think with e-commerce payments. What these guys are clearly doing. These people have a payment platform, and to be fair, you know, in the classic world before e-commerce. Most of the banks in most of the countries were enabling payments and especially for merchants and stores. Mm -hmm. So you physically go to the store, you sell your point of sale device uh, to the store, and everything is facilitated by the bank. The banks pretty much missed out on enabling payments in e-commerce. So there's a whole new generation. You see the logos here in the middle, PayPal, Adgen. They basically said, okay, e-commerce is moving away from the store uh, commerce into the digital space, we're going to enable the easy checkout, and we're going to enable e-commerce payments. So although still these players, and although they are not killing the banks, this part of the traditional banking business model now is completely dominated by platforms, and basically gone. They basically claim the whole domain. Yeah. And they're 100% digital That's first, right. and they're scaling across the globe. Yeah. So a very, uh, I think a very nice example of a platform, a technology platform play by multiple players taking business away from banks. Correct. Okay, next up. What you see here is uh, even more aggressive, and especially for those of you who are here uh, from the Asia region. Uh, in China, uh, we know the, the with Tencent and the WeChat application. Those applications are basically really starting to dominate a very large uh, amount of the day-to-day -day work. And what you basically see here, directly within the chat application, you can manage your cards. You can do mobile top-up. You can transfer money. You can do a quick pay. You can manage your wealth. You can pay your utilities. You can order a taxi. So all these live events are basically available in the WeChat application. And as a consequence of this, the bank, of course, is still directly connected with a physical bank account through the WeChat app. But the bank is operating in the background. Citizens in China are skipping physical debit or credit cards. And it's actually all moving into the smartphone. And in that smartphone, the user experience is not owned by the banks anymore but it's owned by Tencent and Alipay. Yeah, so the banks are effectively marginalized. Huge. So these mobile chat applications are now completely dominating peer-to-peer -peer payments. Yeah. And that's in the trillions, trillions of US dollars, completely, completely redefining the landscape. They're still the bank, but in this case, the bank is already operating in the background. It's like a passive account to fund the digital wallet. Yeah. So imagine you have to compete in China. Good luck. <laughs> let's uh, let's take another example. Wow. So one of the other typical examples that uh, we see in the market is Revolut. 
Um, and if you look at the Revolut uh, applications, super modern, super smooth, super seamless, uh, cool cars, they basically have all the gimmicks to, uh, to reach a certain target audience. Um, the real question then becomes, is this potentially the Uber of banking? Like, are these guys going to take over, yes or no? If you then look at their revenue model, like given that we're discussing business models here, you find that most of these types of players are actually going for a subscription-based fee. You can either have a free account, you even get a card, but pretty much you're, uh, you're good to go. And they're mostly looking to move you into a premium business model or give you a high-end metal card. This type of model, yeah, please. Yeah, it's almost like uh, the freemium model, right? Hey, you start, you start for, uh, you start for free. Yep. I think also you have to invite other users. So for peer-to-peer -peer payment, you can invite your friends. Everybody can onboard in five minutes. Everybody has a free account, and then the whole upgrading game is starting. So for them, it's all about how quickly can we onboard new customers? How can we use social media effects by inviting friends, vouchers, gift cards, peer-to-peer -peer payments, word of mouth? to maximize the organic adoption of the application without a lot of advertising, which they're pulling off. And then eventually, once you have that user base, how do we make them active? And then how do we uplift them to um, the larger premium or metal fee structure? Yeah, from a business model perspective, uh, this play is all about reaching break even, right? Yeah. Similar to a player like Spotify or Netflix or Airbnb. Uh, fair enough, initially they have a higher cost base and have a, say, push to get to a certain level of skill. But once they reach that level of skill, they're pretty much good to go, right? At a super low cost base, they can keep on uh, entering new countries and increasing their footprint. Apparently, investors have confidence in these guys because in the last three years, I think they're now three years after they launched, or they pre-launched, yeah, but announced so roughly that around three million users. Let's debate how many active. But their latest funding round was around 315 million. And I, I hear, I saw news about another uh, round, another 500 million rounds with SoftBank. It's in the works. So it's not like a tiny startup anymore. Nope. This is massively, massively fun. So apparently the investor opinion is, popular opinion, that these guys can actually scale yep. and that the business model has similarities with, let's say, the Amazons or the Netflix or the Airbnbs when they were 10 years younger. Yep. It's a real digital first place. So in that sense. People really make another, yet another platform bet in yet another industry and they believe uh, it will take care of the disruption. Yep. Wow. Then perhaps another observation in how uh, in how Revolut is actually yeah. operationalizing, similarly to another example called N26. The interesting thing that you see with these players is that they're doing a lot of value aggregation. Yeah. So they're not self-building all of these capabilities or self-delivering all of these products. Mm -hmm. They don't even have a balance sheet typically. Yeah. They're effectively aggregating value for third parties that they simply implement and integrate into their UX, into their experience. So it's not just a monoline uh, debit card play where you know you fund the account and you, you do a bit of payment like a debit card, but it's much more. Correct. They basically go from almost nothing to full service. Correct, and they do this extremely fast given that they do smart partnerships. Yeah. They have simple and open technology that they can yeah, basically have a, a really healthy speed with in terms of delivering new products to the market. Yeah. And they validate it like a startup. So if we analyze it then from a business model point of view, just to summarize, they have a platform, it can scale across Europe, it will go into the US very quickly, so it will scale, it's a platform game. Yep. Then they do freemium, you can start for free, you can onboard in five minutes, very, very popular. They apply social media, word of mouth effect, it invites, friends invites other friends to join the platform as well. So they basically organically grow without a lot of you know, big advertisement costs. And then they go into the fee model, and then once that is all going and they can uplift people from free into fee-based, like Netflix, uh, like Spotify, all of them do that game. Uh, then eventually with these smart partnerships, they can go full service and they can also, I guess, get a resale fee or a cut certain out of the services provided by these partners. Yeah. And the real focus of these players is to become the primary bank account of choice. Right? That's, that's what they're pushing for. That's the key question. That's the key question. That's one of the key questions. Yeah. Are, are they continuing to scale to 100 million users? And then can they continue to... But what is interesting, classic here, digital platform and owning the customer experience. Yeah. Just like the Chinese example, who owns the customer experience and who's reducing the friction? From the moment, I guess, you own the customer experience, they can also negotiate with the suppliers to optimize their margin, right? Yep. Because if they own the experience and they own the customer contact point, you're basically in control. Correct? Fully. And that's, that's one element, one ingredient of their play that we believe is very digital first. Yeah. Very nice example. Okay, good. So here, let's kind of uh, try.
try to digest a few rules about how do you kind of run it and what does it mean and how can you actually implement it. What you see here, maybe we can start with the aggregating value. So in the middle, you see the platform. It's all about a digital platform play. And with the platform, you can actually go to certain capabilities. We call them production facilities. So you can get ingredients from your existing core systems if you are a classic bank. You can connect to fintech partners like the Revolut and N26 example. And of course, you can also integrate with your bookkeeping system, or you can integrate with other industries like, like e-commerce or retail, etc. So what we basically see here at the bottom, the digital platform will aggregate value from traditional systems, from fintechs and from other industries, and it will bring it together. And then from there, it will start to orchestrate the customer experience. And we call it, how do you create connected experiences? So one, it will create mobile or web applications that are super easy to use, super easy to onboard. So it will empower the self-directed end customer. It also, the same platform will empower employees, customer facing employees in the call center or even in the branch. Maybe to kind of create the analogy with Uber, the Uber platform is supporting both the driver as well as the end customer. They both have a mobile app. They're slightly different, but they are working and collaborating on the same platform. So we basically see a future for a digital first bank to have a central platform that can aggregate anything from any source and then empower both your self-directed end user as well as uh, employees that are assisting uh, the end customer in the process. And then finally, we believe that with the platform, you, if you ask the right consents, you will collect a lot of data, behavioral data, transaction data, but just like the Googles and the Amazons, you basically are sitting on a trove of very valuable data. And then how do we get the right signal out of the data to protect the customer, to monitor their well-being, but also to give them insights in how they can do financially better and how you can actually do cross and upsell and kind of increase your share of wallet with that particular end customer. So that's kind of the key ingredients of a digital banking platform and how it is kind of the essential cornerstone or the foundation to kind of create these digital first business models. What it also means, and uh, some of you who know Backbase probably have seen this before, but it basically, if you look at your existing classic bank infrastructure, we see a lot of silos. And then if you wonder, like, this IT picture, what you see on the right side in the light gray color, can this be the foundation for the future of your new business model? Very likely, the answer is no. It's too fragmented. It's siloed. It has proprietary architecture. It has duplicated logic. And it is too expensive. The cost-income ratio of running this and running this type of duplication in the channel, but also duplication at the business logic and within the core systems, eventually compared to more leaner digital first platforms, it will not be sustainable. It will be too expensive. So therefore, we basically also believe that a digital platform, which you see here on the right, where you have a single platform, just like Uber or a Revolut, it basically enables you to have a central lean platform to orchestrate all your customer dialogues, either self-directed customers or employees. It will do it over any touch point, so in a mobile device format, in online banking format, maybe in tablets within the branch or with advisors or people that actually will visit the customer at home, but it's just a different screen factor. It's just a different touch point. There's just a single platform to orchestrate all these different users. And then from that digital first platform, you basically can create end-to-end -end journeys for different products. And then you can do it and connect this with your core systems or you can connect it with FinTech partnerships. But in essence, we believe that banks really have to go through a paradigm shift. Yes, from the, the incumbent business model is pretty much on the, on the left side. And that architecture, that technology, but also that cost structure is not sufficient to really make the transition to the right side. I think that's kind of one of the key messages here. So your digital banking platform is really the heart of the future business. Uh, here you see a kind of a little take takeaway. Uh, if you want to go there, how do you move from and how do you kind of create your own uh, digital growth path? How do you kind of create these connected experiences on the right side? Then in the middle, you have the platform. And then here on the left, you have how do you kind of integrate all the different core ingredients? If you wonder like what is inside the platform, there's all sorts of capabilities. Uh, it probably needs to run in an efficient cloud so you have elastic scaling. It needs to manage security, identity, access control, 
like we discussed in a very seamless way. It needs to basically orchestrate all your money uh, with payments, all, all those aspects and orchestrate it across the different actors. It needs to manage your digital experience, everything on the glass, your content, your marketing content, your digital marketing campaigns for cross and upsell. And it probably needs to have elements like a machine learning capability to kind of collect the data, uh, get the transaction data, get the behavioral data and getting the right signal to actually monitor and protect the user or to give them new insights. And then finally, you need to have something to do process orchestration. How do you kind of do straight to processing? How do you do it, everything paperless? How do we make sure that if an end customer wants to do something with self-service in a smartphone, they can toggle a button and everything is done? How do you make sure that it's directly connected between the different system components and the different underlying backend uh, environments? So that's pretty much kind of a little bit of the recipe of what's kind of going on inside, a little bit more a peek inside what's going on within the digital platform and what are the key core elements that you can expect of a, a digital platform to basically orchestrate your future business model. That's it about uh, the business model, but also very much about technology and the platform capabilities that are required to kind of implement uh, the business model. I think to wrap it up, um, the key thing then is actually execution. Yep. And how do we make it happen? Tim. Yeah, so this is, a, this is an interesting picture here. Um, if you look at the, uh, the 80s, 90s, then you basically find that uh, economies of scale were really a good thing. Uh, you would scale up a factory to a certain size and, and reaching that volume and reaching that standardization would allow you to effectively compete in the market. Um, in reality today, having that type of uh, philosophy is exactly the wrong one. Um, however, the reality is that most of us are indeed big boats, right? So we work with a lot of institutions that are relatively large and one would uh, be able to call them uh, corporate. But in reality, we want to become agile. We want to become small, smaller speedboats that have their own, uh, that can own their own destiny, if you will. Um, in order to get there, we need to do quite a few things. Yeah. So first of all, we need to change our culture. Yeah. So I guess uh, let's have a look at uh, the people at uh, DBS, right? How did they do it? And they basically realized, like, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So we can have our nice uh, digital transformations. A learning organization. So those are kind of the ingredients and without going too much in detail and also to wrap it up, basically what it means here is that we, we would like to explore with, uh, with you online and, and not for today but in the future ideas about it, it's the culture. It's, you can have the technology, you can have the platform, but if you still operate with a classic mindset where business and IT are not really collaborating or where you potentially are outsourcing the majority of your digital work, is that really digital first? You know? And Amazon, how are they doing it? How do they work? Can we visit them? What can we learn from their way of working? So basically, this is probably one of the areas where I'm, I fear that the, most of the banks have probably the, the biggest challenge in actually executing their digital transformation. Is that fair to say? It's, it's very fair to say, uh, although they all have the vision to go there, right? Yeah. 
So they all understand that there's new ingredients. It's not just technology, it's also people and culture. Um, I think the good thing about this uh, particular slide and uh, drawing here is it's actually a relatively simple process. Okay. It's, it's not yeah. new. Uh, these agile methodologies, all these frameworks that are out there, they're pretty much proven by now. So the preference and uh, the frameworks and the methodologies are there. Yeah. Think design sprinting, yeah. for one. Think agile, scrum, uh, those types of approaches. And if you then think about how these methodologies actually work, it's all about being extremely customer first, customer obsessed, if you will, like Amazon, for instance, like Netflix, like Uber, and using very simple uh, lean startup uh, methodologies to quickly build, measure something, and learn from that experience. I'm doing it in super small bite-sized chunks with small autonomous teams. At the end of the day, that's where all boil, all boils on. Boils so on. if I run a 20 people uh, startup, I like it. I can do it. We can execute it. These people know how to do it. They've done it in previous companies. Uh, that's the type of DNA. But now translate that into a uh, 2,000 employee bank, or translate it into a 20,000 uh, yeah. employee yeah, bank. Like DBS, yes, right? Like DBS, right? Yeah. So that is that is a massive change program. Yeah. Correct. And and how's that going? Yeah. Well, if you look at the uh, the previous slide, what is needed to get there? Right. They took at least three or four years to make that transition. But again, if you look at their main themes, it's very much acting like a typical, truly digital company. Uh, and that's, that's a massive mindset change, first of all. This is ag agile at a massive scale, or this is agile, or this is entrepreneurship. In, 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 compared to the classic bank with risk, with compliance, with all these kind of uh, functions that also need to redefine their, what is risk? Or how how do we make pragmatic bets or little experiments? Yeah. Um, I think similarly there are perhaps as, as a little bit of a data point there. Uh, if you say the two pizza team, that yeah. pizza team includes compliance, it includes legal, it includes risk. Yeah. You organize yourself on a customer problem that needs to be solved, yeah. and that's typically what you see in these types of case studies. Uh, but still, as a main takeaway, this, this is one of the main topics to actually get there. Yeah. It's a real big change effort. So eventually, uh, it basically means also that if you really want to become digital first, you cannot completely outsource this. No, right? no, 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 definitely not. Of course, you have suppliers, you have strategy suppliers, you have digital suppliers, technology suppliers, preferably all digital savvy, but net, net, uh, you need to exercise yep. yourself. Yeah, and basically making the decision is basically the start of the journey. But it also that really requires more technology and more digital leadership uh, for banks. Right. Yeah, digital leadership that is able to complement it with traditional bankers that people look, that know the banking métier, but then really a very happy uh, marry marriage with people that can really bring that digital DNA delivery and culture and, and way of working way yeah. and, and fully empowered to do it, uh, let's say, not only in the digital lab, but to do it at scale, uh, digital for the bank. And that's one of the topics we'll, uh, we'll go into in the next webinar. Yeah, look yeah. forward. Yeah. We'll try and maybe we should actually invite some of the, the bankers out there. We meet uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and maybe see uh, either anonymous or uh, in full disclosure get some data what, what they are willing to share about uh, the, the, the do's and the don'ts, right? Yeah. That would be nice. All right, so uh, let's wrap it up. The, the key kick, uh, wrap up is that it is really about how do you control the customer experience and especially how do we focus on these next generation uh, users, our future generation, they will set the tone, and especially by 2025. How do we skate uh, where the fuck is going from a user experience uh, point of view? I really like the examples uh, you gave us, uh, Tim, there. The second key thing is that we have to basically create the platform, the platform that will aggregate data from any source and then actually will help you to control the customer experience because it's the battle for the customer experience and making that seamless. And people that actually have platform economics or a business model that has strong platform capabilities inside, a single platform, lean, scalable, cross-border, cross-language, cross-brand, those are the key elements. And also pretty much digital, paperless, less reliance on the brands, and collecting a lot of data to kind of get signal and insight to take care of the well-being of the end customer. And then finally, it's about the culture. Uh, it's almost like to go to the gym. You need to make a fundamental commitment in leadership and, and probably this is not a thing you do overnight. This is probably, to your point, a, a multi, multi-year process. And taking certain parts of the bank and step-by-step step getting more uh, elements of the traditional bank exposed and actively involved in this new way of working. Yeah. Yeah. And having that reality check that that is needed to become digital first, that's, that's a start. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, Tim, we are at the full hour where uh, time flies. Maybe we can quickly go to the Q&A. And uh, so for the people in the audience, 
there is um, uh, there is a console where you can actually ask questions. It says uh, questions. Please feel free to uh, to ask uh, the question. Yeah, the beginning of the slides there. All right, okay. that, is, that doesn't look good. So again, uh, this is one of the common questions people ask. Can uh, we share? Can we get a copy of the slides and the recording? Absolutely. If you are tuned in a little bit later, uh, Backpage will share uh, a copy of the slides uh, later on uh, tomorrow. Uh, so that's all going to be fine. Um, any other questions here that people uh, like to ask? Okay. Let's go this one. So maybe you can read the question and we can discuss it a little bit. Yeah, so one question here is, in terms of, the, this is a question from Linda Thru, if I uh, pronounce it correctly. Um, in terms of the timeline, how do we become a digital first bank? Is 2025 a target not far too long, considering the current market developments we are seeing? Shouldn't it be happening today? Of course, uh, you are talking to a slightly biased, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're asking the question to a slightly biased uh, audience here. Uh, I think it's extremely urgent. Um, so maybe 2025 is seven years out for a full transformation. But I think most of the banks we are working with, we, we work with more aggressive timelines and to uh, work with um, a short term plan, like a, a six or 12 month plan, really kind of making the right, uh, the right moves. So I would say uh, a two year horizon, uh, I think for a more ambitious player is, uh, is quite essential, I would say. But to do it at full, to do it also with a bank at scale, um, and, and really kind of make everything paperless and to drive everything uh, to the right level, then also two years is a relatively short framework to really make everything paperless, uh, to make a single platform that operates both for end customers as well as end users. I think it's also important to have a more realistic horizon that to do a full transformation, uh, um, let's say a time scale of two to four years, uh, is probably also more realistic for full execution end to end. Yeah. Uh, this is actually quite a nice uh, question from Olaf. How do you tear down the silos, break the little kingdoms, make people give away some of what they worked for for decades? Which is something we actually see happening in uh, reality, right? Yeah, in, in all fairness, and uh, like it or not, uh, many of these uh, change processes, of course, are very political. And I think also it kind of really requires a decisive leadership uh, top down uh, to basically uh, force people to stop with some of these games or actually just define the new operating model, which is more based on the lean startup, and then really invite people to join or not to join. And also the parts uh, where people do not want to join or they don't have the right fit because in the new operating model, they don't fit in the roles or they don't have uh, a, an emotional commitment or a mental commitment to make it successful, I think uh, it is important, uh, it sounds a little bit harsh, but it is really important to select the people that actually want to be in the boat. And uh, we've seen this happening with quite a few banks around the world. At a given moment, of course, you need to kind of get collective insights, you need to try to get people into the journey to make the change. But uh, there is a point, sooner or later, that you really have to make uh, the cutoff point, and you really have to decide who are the people that are in the boat, and also, who are the people that better uh, stay out of the boat yeah. and actually leave the party? Yeah. I don't want to sound harsh, but if you don't do it, you get uh, uh, a very strange, toxic, blended model, and you probably will end up uh, stuck in the middle. Yeah. Because also, you are not going to be very decisive in the overall speed and thoroughness of your digital transformation. So also, your business model transition will potentially run the risk to be stuck in the middle. So I think to a degree, although it sounds a little bit harsh, uh, at a given moment, it is consensus, it is collaboration, it's giving people the opportunity to join, but then also um, I would expect people to be all in. The second part is I think you cannot change the bank uh, complete. You can really pick your, your islands, your battles. So pick a line of business, uh, either retail or business banking, identify different parts. So how do you slice and dice the big elephant? And basically then pick your battles. Within the line of business, what are within, uh, you know, target country operations where you can start and you can experiment in countries and from there you can develop a blueprint. So we see banks doing all sorts of changes, but never uh, across the board. They pick their, uh, their, pick their beach hats and then from there you build the initial success, you build the momentum and then from there uh, you start to, uh, to expand. It's almost like land grab, yeah. old world versus new world. Yeah. 
And then perhaps another question to this topic, which I think is a nice one from Lucas Yuri. Would it be that traditional board members don't have the mindset, skill, and incentives to change their existing business models in a more urgent way? Uh, I would like to say this respectfully, but yes, indeed, we still, uh, I'm afraid that there's quite a lot of board members out there that uh, don't have the technology background. They have more classic mindset. They are not exposed to topics we've been discussing here. So I think uh, to a degree that is very concerning. Yeah. It's do very we, concerning. Do we also perhaps see it the other way around? That there's board members that have this mindset. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank, thank you for asking me. Of course, of course. It, it's like a normal distribution. What is very good is that more and more board members, without even all the in-depth technology, people are already at the awareness level that they need to do digital transformation. Even if you are, let's say, less tech-savvy or more classic banking-oriented, people totally know and they are aware. The second part is that you know you need to go, but do you have the right experience and the steermanship to actually change the boat and to run the operation? So what you now dare see is that a lot of bank, uh, banks actually start to hire, already hired, a new generation, more digital savvy leaderships, and give them the authority and the right position in the org chart to really drive that change. Is it still very difficult to actually really make the change? Because just a few hires won't cut it, right? But we definitely see very positive examples where the bank in the top of the pyramid is completely committed to go and is also very decisive in kind of hiring new DNA, more digital and technology savvy DNA. To actually drive change. So we see, fortunately, we see both. And I guess also to a degree, that's probably the difference between the winners and the losers of the transformation. Yeah. Yeah. All right, shall we go for a final question? Yeah, let's do one more. Okay, this question is from uh, Ganapti. Typically, where do you expect the beginning for a digital first journey in a bank? Do we start the operating models? Do we start serving our customers? Where do you begin? Um, I would start with the customer. I would start outside in. I really would like to see that. I think that the, the real fundamental battle, first and foremost, is to own the customer experience. To really run, just like an e-commerce, you need to run the most successful e-commerce shop. And then you need to take care of the logistics and the distribution, etc. But get your category where you're going to play and then start to figure out what are these customers and what are the customer journeys we have today and how can we remove friction. And then you kind of start to reason, okay, what does it mean for the platform? I think it's inside out versus outside in. Most of the classic banks are organized not around customers, but they are organized around products, product groups, and product owners, and classic products. And they just care about how do we push the product. I think fundamentally I would start on the other side. Start with the customer segments, start with the customer research and the customer insights, then translate that into UX. Technology vendors like Backblaze already have a lot of capabilities end-to-end -end ready. They have the platform ready. Take that as an accelerator, and then you start to kind of reason your way back into the bank. Mm -hmm. But I would start with, I think if you do not own the customer experience in the next two years, it's going to be very problematic. Yeah. And actually, customer, that's the only thing customers see. They don't care about your back office. So I really would say start outside in, start with the customer journeys, and then from there, how do you onboard your legal people, your compliance people? How do you kind of onboard the classic product owners to participate in that digital world? So, but start with owning the customer experience, and then from there, see how you can onboard uh, the, 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 the mid office and the more, let's say, classical parts of the bank. That, perhaps, makes uh, that, that makes a lot of sense, but also I could probably feel the anxiety in the banks. That means that I need to run my full digital transformation all of a sudden. Or can I start small? You can start small. You can. We see large banks that operate in multiple countries. We basically see them now creating a portfolio where they do digital transformation at a country level. So they really make local bets. They, they, they are not kind of betting the mothership, but they go to the local satellite operations and they're still very sizable. And they basically work with local management teams that actually run the country operation and that's where they do the change. In other examples, uh, the retail team is more progressive versus, for instance, business banking. And now you see within business banking, or in commercial banking, a wave of digital transformation. So I would say line of business or country operations, um, sometimes it's about kind of creating a whole new brand, brand new digital banking operation. We see that happen as well. Yeah, create your own neo bank, create a whole new separate, uh, separate from the main operation. Get 200 people in the right place and, and basically do the same funding as a Revolut has, but then funded by the bank and uh, and allow these people to kind of. So there's multiple bets and and there's there's many variations in how people uh, basically um, uh, slice and dice uh, the elephant. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Good.
Thank you very much to uh, everyone here in the audio. Uh, we really appreciate the fact uh, that you've been uh, with us here in the last uh, hour. And um, we're looking forward to, to uh, reconnect with you probably in six weeks from now, and that will be in the new year. For now, thank you very much. Tim, thank you for being here as well. Yep, and um, Thank you very much. For all of you, have a nice uh, remaining of your day. Thank Cheers. you. Bye-bye.